welcome to Crisis Communication. This is the third in our series on this program. Last week when we concluded, we were into maturational crises. Those of you that have been following us in this program and class I know that we've looked at situational crises, existential crises, maturational. It took us a while to work our way from infancy uh, through adolescence into adulthood last week. Uh, but we're up to midlife at this point. Uh, we've got students in the studio class who are primed with their sock puppets. Uh, and uh, they're going to be participating later on with that. Uh, Darren, are you out at West Houston tonight? I'm here. Okay, welcome back. Did you have a good trip? Had a great trip. A little cold. Good. You have anybody out there with you? Not so far. Not so far. Okay. And hello to our delayed viewers. Uh, we hope you're going to enjoy this as well. Okay, we have said from time to time that a crisis for one person may be ordinary work for someone else. And, uh, you know, there's some people who do surgery on a routine basis. Some of us would be hard put to put a tourniquet on. Uh, some folks repair computers for a living. Most of us freak out if our hard drives crash. So it's important to recognize that meaning, meaning is a matter of individual perception. And we want to keep that in mind as we continue to look at crises this evening. The meaning is in the mind of the receiver. We said that in lesson one. Because different things affect people in different ways. And so that meaning is an individual perception. And what is a crisis for one person may not be a crisis for someone else. But recognizing that qualifier, let's go ahead and pick up with midlife crises. Uh, I know we have a new student tonight, Jacqueline, uh, and we welcome her. She had a midlife crisis just getting into this class. <laughs> you want to comment on that, Jacqueline? Did you lose track of how many stops you made trying to get in here? <laughs> yeah, Nancy, help her remember to hold that down. Oh, gave me great appreciation for, okay. for college students at college age. She commented before class started tonight that perhaps one should take this class before trying to enroll here. <laughs> but fortunately, not everyone has that difficulty and uh, so forth. But anyway, hers was an interesting series of experiences getting here. But we welcome her. Uh, she's been watching the tapes and now joins our studio class. Okay, what happens when you hit midlife? We, we've talked about young adults and children coming into your life. You get, of course, it's kind of hard to tell where midlife is these days. Is that 30s, 40s? You know, some 15 year olds I know probably think midlife is 28, but uh, most of us would, would put it somewhere around 40 or 50 and so forth. There was, a, yeah, Karen. And as a person who's cl uh, much closer to 40 than I'd care to be, mm -hmm. um, of course, I'm going to consider midlife as somewhere still farther out there. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm obviously still young, but I remember my father as a joke talking about that. Midlife obviously meant that with the age at which you could trade in your your forty something wife and get two twenty year olds. Oh. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, what what are there good things? Is everything in midlife a crisis? Nancy. No, I I think as you get, I'll have to say from experience in <laughs> toward in the thirties and all that you just start realizing that uh, you don't. You know, it's just shifting gears to me, you know, and that you, you start, I start thinking about what are the things that I haven't done that I want to do. Mm. And so in one sense, uh, you know, you're not so worried about things. You can enjoy life more. Okay. You think you shake off some of the peer pressure, some of the things we talked about in adolescence last week. And um, one woman told me in this class that you could tell how old, I'm checking earrings out here, they're not too large, that, that the size of a woman's earrings increased proportionately with her age, so I didn't dare wear large ones tonight. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I think that that's reflective of, I don't know what the guys do, <laughs> uh, but that this is reflective of uh, the freer spirit that comes with some degree of maturity and, and experience and so forth. Well, why do we claim that people are in midlife crisis? Go ahead, Karen. Well, that's when people are doing things that other people maybe don't, don't feel like is appropriate for their age. It's, this is, midlife crisis is the classic thing of, of the, 
the um, father and whatnot who suddenly trades in the, the sedan for a sports car and is mm -hmm. driving around, you know, getting acquiring speeding tickets. Okay, and the speeding tickets may not be appropriate, but often you're mid-age before you can acquire the vehicle of your dreams. You have to save for 15 or 20 years to be able to afford it. Okay, what other kinds of things happen by midlife? Robert? It's like a time of reflection. You think about, uh, you try to look at your life and see, is it, has it turned out the way you, you thought it was supposed to be? And it's also a time, I guess, when they look back, you start saying, well, have I actually done this? And if not, can I do something now to change and go mm -hmm. towards some of the goals that I, that I thought were great when I was 25 years old and found out they weren't? Can I start over now? Okay, and when you start thinking like that, what kind of a crisis might you be having? Maturational, situational, existential. Karen? Existential. Okay. You're, you're questioning your beliefs. Okay, your, your values are coming into question. You're, you're checking out your beliefs. You may be changing ideas about some things. And it can go either way. It may be that you now have the personal freedom to say what those friends in high school or, or Group X or Y or Z thought is not so important. I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. Or it may be that uh, you're, you're realizing that you have to change, that you've decided for whatever reason you're not able to meet your goals as you originally set them, and maybe you're adjusting your perception of who you are because you haven't measured up. It can go either way. It can be a, a freeing kind of thing that causes you to be brave enough to get out there and, and do something new and try a new adventure, or it may be a, a more accurate assessment of who you are to say, well, I need to shift focus a little bit here. Okay, what, can you think of other things that happen to you, 40s, 50s, Karen? Well, at least, you know, traditionally, that was almost the peak of your career for people in the corporate world, and so at that point, you've, you've definitely become clear you're either going to make it or have made it maybe to, you know, the vice president's office or whatever, or you've realized you're stuck in mid-management and this is as far as you're going to go, and so you may have to start looking around for something else to derive your satisfaction from because mm -hmm. you're not going to be a big wheel. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You're also discovering as you get in the midlife time that your body is not capable ah. of certain functions and you're having to readjust <clears throat> possibly if your profession was more physical. You'll have to readjust to something possibly more mental. And so you're having to relearn. Okay. So Even though there's some 80-year-olds going cross-country on bicycles or whatever, uh, more ailments and diseases start to kick in. Midlife, whatever that is, uh, some people will find they have their first heart attack or their blood pressure starts to go up or some other kind of health problem will cause you to stop and reassess what's going on. Good point. Okay, we, we mentioned briefly last week the sandwich family. And that may happen to people in their 20s or 30s, but it can happen anytime on. You remember what the sandwich family involved? Those of you that were here. Okay, remember the, the case of the young man caring for children and elderly parents at the same time? And sometimes, right when you should be at the peak of your career, uh, maybe you're making more money than you ever did before, you're really feeling comfortable and successful with your job, then uh, because of physical situations, ailments, conditions, things start to cave in around you. We've got a situational crisis going that's also a function of the age of, of the older persons. But you may find that you have one or more parents uh, needing medical attention, needing more care, uh, they, whether they're placed in nursing homes or uh, moved in with the family. Uh, it, you, know, you may find parents caught with their own children, with their parents then responding like children. Uh, when you see our makeup tape, if, as you'll recall, we, we were delayed in preparing the first tape of this semester. And probably the week of your examination, 
uh, they'll, it would be my guess, although I haven't been told, that that's when they'll air this tape that we missed the first week. But what we have there are a number of performances by members of the forensics team that capture different kinds of crises, and there's one of those deals with a young man who's in the sandwich family uh, type of scenario. I think you're going to enjoy, going to enjoy those presentations because they capture in little 10-minute snapshots people in crisis, and we'll be talking about those more later on. Okay, as you, you move along then and become older, what happens? You, you've reached the peak of your career, whether that's middle management or the top, then what? Just about the time you've got it made, it's time to... Retire. Retire, okay, <laughs> the group chorus response. Uh, right, and what happens with retirement? Is this a good thing, a bad thing, some of both? Well, it can be good if it's been planned for. Oh, okay, how, how might you plan for it? Well, you have maybe mutual funds or IRAs and 401ks. Okay, you're talking about financial planning financial then, planning. so that you but can... Then you can reach a snag <clears throat> if they come to you with an early retirement package. And okay, so if, if you've gone to full-length retirement, I mean all the way to regular retirement, and have planned well, then there should be financial income pretty much even to, with what you're accustomed to. But, but you get, as Julie saying, these early buyouts, which may sound good on the front end, $100,000 now, but you've got to live three years or four years until you actually start drawing your retirement. What were you going to say, Melanie, so we cruise past that? Well, I was going to say that you can go through some psychological changes as well because mm. when you get to retirement, whether you're at retirement age or status in your job, um, a lot of times your children are out of the house and you feel the empty nest syndrome. And then a lot of times uh, family starts, um, your parents may pass away, a lot of things start happening like that. Too. Okay, empty nest may be before during or after retirement, just kind of depending on when you had your children, how many children you have, whether you divorced and remarried and, you know, have a, a large extended family, this may kind of come in phases and so forth. Kara? Well, there's also psychological, I think, effects simply from retiring and leaving your career. There's a lot of people for whom that's their number one identifier, the mm -hmm. thing that, that's their you know, I mean, after all, you get together with a group of strangers, what's one of the number one questions you'll ask is, what do you do? And so, when you don't have that to say anymore, you start to feel some loss of identity. And especially if that's the only thing you've ever done. You know, some people have several facets to their life and they can increase one as they lose another. Okay. Nancy. The interesting thing happened to my parents. They both retired at the same time. And so they had to go through their adjustments, you know, together like that. And they both said later it would probably been easier if one would have retired first and the other other one is they both weren't used to not working. They worked for years. And so, it, you know, it was just an adjustment to how they spent their time mm -hmm. and what they did together. and. You know, so they were the both best. suddenly around the house all the time. Mm -hmm. That also brings up stress on the marriage a lot of times. When yes. they retire, all of a sudden now they're with each other all okay, the time. Okay, that's what I've been waiting for you to say. <laughs> you know, my mom was one of those, uh, she worked until she got married and then was not employed after that. She worked hard, she just didn't get money for it. You know, and then when dad retired, he was underfoot all the time. And here she'd had all day to sew or read a book, or go over to the neighbor lady's house and drink coffee and chat, you know, but a real leisurely thing. And suddenly, here's husband home who wants breakfast cooked, and, and they come from the older generation, you know, where dad did well to open a can of soup, and he, I can say this because they're not around anymore, you know, but he did well to get a can of soup heated. And suddenly mother's cooking breakfast and fixing lunch and, you know, doing and cleaning up three meals a day and finding her lifestyle very much affected and somewhat cramped. And at first it sounds like fun. <laughs> Jacqueline's saying, no, no matter how much you love him, you don't want him underfoot all day. Huh? 
or vice versa. Okay, uh, then comes that lovely older phase. The older years where, where what happens to you? You really start falling apart. And somebody has to take care of you. And that has to be one of the most frustrating things that we encounter. I mean, maybe there are a few people out there who are just waiting to disintegrate so somebody can take care of them, but uh, I doubt it. You know, what, what happens to you from a psychological standpoint? What you're losing what, Robert? All your life you had the power, especially <coughs> with my, my, grand, my grandparents, they grew up in the Depression era, and they were always uh, very ingenu had a lot of ingenuity and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, they were self made people and now as I see them getting older and, and they they're they're having to rely more on us and it's hard on them because they've always been able to do it on their own like they were the either the matriarch or the patriarch of the family and now they're having to rely on us to help them around drive them places mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that and it's really it's really hard on my grandmother because she's all I mean she that's her independence is being able to drive somewhere and she hates the fact that we have to drive her now so it's it's really hard on her mm -hmm. I've heard some older people say it's like they go back into childhood almost because because of having to be taken care of and being driven places, have um, your socks put on for you, little things if you can't bend as well. It's like uh, you almost go backwards mm -hmm. and it's very frustrating for Because you're people. losing power, you're losing right. control right. and that's a very important dimension of who we are and it calls for adjustments. Okay, it calls for decisions then about what, you know, the, the younger family members have to decide whether or not they're going to move the elderly in with them <coughs> or are they going to be placed in nursing homes, retirement centers. You know, there's a, a wide variety in the choices that you have depending on the money that you have. Uh, it generates an existential crisis in many instances in trying to decide do we keep loved ones with us or do we resort to nursing homes you know, where is the balance between the ability to care for people that you love and your ability to survive the stress and the physical drain uh, particularly if, if everyone in the family is working there may be emotional drain anything you want to add Okay. But if the the loss is not just their faculties or their their ability to walk around, but also their possessions, because when they're having to move in with an, another child, or adult child, or into a nursing home, I find that most of them are very distressed over losing certain possessions that mm -hmm. they can no longer maintain. Okay, isn't your space important to you? I mean, even in here, you know, we've all got our little, I have more space because I'm the teacher, you know, but you have your little spaces out there. You don't want anybody messing with that. You know, somebody shouldn't just reach over and push your books over and get in your space. And our houses, our apartments, or whatever we have, our cars, that's all part of our space. And, and part of losing power and losing control uh, is tied up in this notion of loss of space. We know with children, and we talked about this a little bit, with children, you know, it's important that they have their own space. And even if you have three children in one bedroom, they need to know that corner or this chest or whatever is my space. And if you've had a whole house that's your space, and now you have one chest of drawers in one bedroom, in half of a bedroom in a nursing home, it's a big adjustment. Okay, what kinds of personality changes do you see happening? Maybe not with your own relatives, but with others you've been around. I think that uh, I've experienced with a lot of older people, they, bec they become sort of, um, I don't want to use the word bitter, but upset or angry with the outside world because of the changes they're going through and maybe they're not ready for them. And I found, I volunteered at a, 
elderly home and a lot of the older people their only thing they had left to talk about was their children and maybe one or two things they'd done that was great to them and they hold on so tightly to that and they're angry about a lot of things. Okay, some are very much abandoned, aren't they? And others are not. <coughs> you know, I had uh, the little lady lived next door to me and passed away, I think, when she was in her late 80s. But she had so many, she and her, her sister lived there, and they had so many visitors. She'd been an, she never married, she was an elementary school teacher for 50 years, uh, not teacher, principal, pardon me. And people loved that little woman. And, you know, a little petite thing with wiry red hair and, and all, and, you know, and people came to visit her regularly. Now, what makes the difference? I mean, we're all, I mean, I guess we hope we're going to be there. You know, the other option is to check out early. Okay? Don't you think that the difference between people like that is they're staying mentally stimulated and they're involved with other people's lives or other, other events and they stay on top of the topics, the current affairs? Uh, you may, can talk maybe to them more that, and they can respond alert. to them more. Um, but, you know, her sister was not that mentally alert, and people were responsive to her, too. I don't know. Somebody told me once, you know, we all have to figure out what we're going to be like when we grow old, just on the chance that we do. And someone said, look around and find a person who is aging well, who is the kind of person you would like to be when you get there. You know, because there are some elderly people with sunny dispositions that crack jokes that are just fun to be, they're just a hoot to be around. You know, you don't know what they're going to do next, um, or even if they're calm or quiet or predict predictable people, they aren't cranky, they don't whine, um, you know, and, and some I've known must be in pain from, from the ailments that they have but they just handle it differently. And so I think people are drawn to those more than those that have fallen into a bitter, angry choice. You know, and, and granted, there's plenty of reason to be bitter and angry and frustrated. Mm -hmm. I hate to say this, but it keeps coming in my head. I think it might have a lot to do with money. Does that with make money? Any money. I think I've noticed a lot of elderly people who have money don't have to be put in the nursing homes, don't have to have their things taken from them. They seem a little happier. Okay, That's that goes back to what we were saying about yeah. control and space and so forth. Um, it, I don't know. I'm, I'm scared to generalize, but it, it could be a factor. But I've known people in nursing homes that are just as sweet and kind and gentle-hearted and but certainly it probably makes it easier to be a positive person as long as you're in your own home and, and all. But I just thought some people seem to be you know that they have a lot of wisdom as they grow older you know and, and those are the people to me that can laugh about things and uh, um, you know it's a choice in life and some people choose to make the best of their life and aren't so, you know, look at the cup half full rather than half empty. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, as you get older, I've noticed that people are a lot more who they are. The pretenses go away. You know, you're who you are and maybe it's just that it takes a long time. You know, you can grow old bitterly or, you know, who you are really comes out as you get, you know, as all the other things in life go away. Very good. Okay, you, you've got grandparents in a nursing home and you're going to visit. What should you expect? <coughs> hmm. Now, I mentioned that some of you are, are late ads to the class. Some of you out there in the home audience may be too. Uh, I mentioned this is from a previous semester, so none, none of these people have to own up to this because it doesn't apply. But we had one grandmother who was a bed hopper in the nursing home. 
<laughs> you know, and she didn't like to sleep alone. And at least this is what her granddaughter shared in class. You know, she didn't like to sleep alone. And so they might just find her in any room in the hallway because she was looking for a nice little old man to keep her warm at night. You know, now if, you know, if people here are chuckling, if that, if that were my grandmother, I'd be embarrassed <laughs> at all. Oh, you know, oh, there, there are stories of trays of food that have been thrown into the hall and uh, one who took her cane and whacked out a window because they locked the door and, uh, you know, they weren't going to lock her in the room. She'd show them. Uh, another peeled her clothes off right there in the lobby because she didn't feel like wearing them. You know, so there, there are a number of inhibitions uh, that go. You know, anything you want to share? Mm -hmm. there, there was one incident when uh, my daughter was volunteering at the uh, uh, retirement home, and uh, this one... Which will go unnamed. Yes. <laughs> to protect the guilty. <laughs> the, the one woman, bless her heart, she kept looking for the field. Whatever it was, it was the field, because she had to plant. And apparently she was in her 90s. And she would wander off and cross a major street and go off and pass the post office. And every other day they'd have to go look for her until they finally had her more secured. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad she was safe. Okay. But there are a lot of funny things that ha I mean, they, they can be crises. We've said before a crisis for one person is not a crisis for someone else. And there are a lot of these things, you know, you can be embarrassed beyond words and never go back or you can just laugh and say that's the way it is in this place you know it, it's the way things I mean you, do you see funny incidents too well we went uh, Christmas killing one Christmas my whole family went and my brother walked into this one old lady's room and she instantly and people had been going in and out of her room all day and she grabs my brother thinking that he is, it's funny now, but at the time it was a little bit sad, he, thinking that he was her son, and just talking to him, and mm -hmm. do you remember this, when this, and we were all just, and he wasn't about to leave and say, you know, I'm not your son. I don't know, get away. so he, he played the part. He played the part. Good for him. Was, you know, patted her and everything, and yeah. then walked out going, oh my God. <laughs> but that was she good. was confused. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's good, because... And, and you'll see as you read in your text, too, and the, you know, to play and to participate in their reality as time and opportunity permits itself, yeah. Another thing is usually the people in the home share a room and, you know, sometimes one of the women or men may have more visitors than the other or they, mm -hmm. there's some jealousy that goes on. I know with my grandmother there was some of her clothing would disappear. Mm. You know. So, I don't know, I heard somebody was trading false teeth oh, no. once, <laughs> you know, theirs didn't fit so well, so they borrowed someone else's, you know. So, I don't know, I, I heard there was an incident over ice cream once. Uh, do, do we have puppets that are ready to do ice cream tonight? Okay, I think so. Come on up here. I think we're going to have a little fun with these sock puppets here. And then we'll get serious again. Yes, mm. yes, you're serving. That's right. And I'm first in line. <laughs> okay, Karen thinks she's first in line. Is that yes. Right? Yeah, come on over. No pushing, no shoving. Wait. <laughs> Have to stand in no, line. No, move, move. <laughs> Back on up. I'm first. I'm always last. I got here first. I want my ice cream. You're just slow. That's not my problem. Now, 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 now. We only have strawberry and banana left. Where's the vanilla? Banana. You know, good. you know, I need vanilla. I, I banana mean, banana and stra it's all gone. Sorry. Well, I didn't really want those other flavors anyway. They're not vanilla. Are you vanilla? It's okay. I don't want. I want this one anyway. <laughs> I don't want strawberry. I don't want banana. Now, I, I mean, I've lived to be ninety-three. I think it's pretty simple to just get some vanilla ice cream. You know, Is that too much to ask? I no. I just had some vanilla ice cream and it just disappeared. Anybody have any ideas? You're always griping. You're always griping. I can't stand it. It's disgusting. It's really pathetic. You can't even keep track of your own ice cream. Look, she's got it, okay? Here. I don't want it anymore. Oh. Yeah. She's, <laughs> you're going to have to do something with her. She's throwing ice cream now. now I, I mean, okay. I... Okay. Control yourselves, children. It'll be all right. I do. I'm not a child. I've never seen a food 
food fight in this cafeteria before. <laughs> Myrtle, get a grip. We had one yesterday, okay? <laughs> Where were you? You just have to be the last in line. Because you're slow. I told you that. I have to roll backwards. I can't go forwards. We're tired of you taking ice cream away from people. We put you back there for a reason. <laughs> no, I mean, you're slow. I mean, you know, you're just going to have to learn to wheel that thing a little faster. Somebody should get me first. That's what it is. Take turns. She's always complaining. I've known her for several years now. Well, I know, I know she remember that. You can't remember the food fight from yesterday, but you can remember she complained. You've got my glasses on anyway. I do not. These are my glasses. I they've know. Been I saw my, them in the lobby. They're my glasses. They've been my glasses. I think I'm just like going to have to go back to my room. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't, don't, go to you probably kitchen. better push her because she'll <laughs> never go make it. Go do your hair, ladies. Go do your hair, ladies. Thank you, you ladies. very much. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Okay, what's the point of this? Besides having a little fun in class. Sometimes it's the smallest things which cause the greatest arguments. Okay, sometimes it's the small things, the smallest things, that cause the greatest arguments. And you often lose perspective. You know, the nursing home may become this person's world. If they don't get out regularly, if they don't go visit family on the weekends, whatever, this becomes their world. Uh, I have an uncle in a nursing home. And, and, you know, there's a ritual. Certain things happen at certain times of the day, whether it's serving ice cream or whatever. And, you know, if you're not there at the right time, you lose out. And so that becomes very important. Um, I've, I know of one individual who chose to play uh, dominoes or 42 rather than visit with guests and the family members were offended. You know, here we, you know, drove an hour and a half across, well, from one town to another. But anyway, they, they traveled a great distance to make this visit, and then the individual with some degree of senility chose to play dominoes with friends rather than visit with relatives. Now, it's not meant as an insult to the relatives, but it's a choice about what's practical at that point in time. You know, your friends are going to be there day after day. The game is going to be waiting, or it won't be waiting, though they may replace you. You know, and who knows when these out of town relatives will be back again. And it disrupted the routine. Okay, Karen. I was also thinking that would also maybe was it a way to express some control in his life as opposed to feeling like, you know, if, if you spend your time in this little world waiting for people to come and entertain you and visit you, you, you could end up a long wait since mm -hmm. obviously, you know, and that was also a way of it saying, you know, I don't necessarily have to, to, you know, do it to your schedule. This is when it was convenient for you to come, but maybe they didn't, you know, I don't know that they necessarily talked to him about well, when would he like to be visited. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but you just have to, it's almost like tunnel vision. This becomes the world, just like my week in the hospital, you know, everything else fell to the wayside and sleeping in between the nurses' schedules, and, you know, the, all the time dimensions changed and the priorities changed and that happens anytime you change your location too, whether it's a new job in a new city or moving to a new location and so forth. Okay, anything else you want to add about old age, retirement? Mm -hmm. Well, that just reminds me that the less flexibility of, you know, I, I would drive my grandparents on trips and she had to eat at 12 noon and we were in North Dakota in the middle of a hailstorm one time and it was close to noon and, and she was, you know, it's, it's like, like you say, the tunnel vision, the schedule and her fixed schedule was more important than the reality that was going on. Okay. The other thing that happens midlife on, but particularly with old age, is what? The Julie? death of a spouse. Okay, just death in general, and we'll get to this more when we get to 
uh, the personal loss chapter. But the longer you live, the more friends and relatives you get to bury. My mother-in-law was the youngest of 15 children. Now, and she was the last to die. And you don't think about that when you have children. You know, but whether there are three of you or 15 of you, somebody's going to be last. Uh, the law, you know, you, you think you want to live to be really old, but that means that all the people on your block, if, if you're in a traditional neighborhood, as my parents were, you know, uh, one little lady, my mother was next to last of the little old ladies in a cluster. You know, and I felt so sorry for the woman across the street who was then the last one. And that's 300 miles from here, so I haven't been back to see what happened to her. Ginger? Well, my friend Gladys, who you know, had, had a best friend since they were five, and they lived across the street from each other, and they got married, and they were always together, and they were 85 best friend life. And even though the woman's uh, children were very distraught at her death, for Gladys, it was so bad. I mean, her children were 50 and 60, but Gladys had been her friend. They had been best friends for 80 years. And that was just really devastating for her. <laughs> Fight for it there. Just hold it down and go for it. Well, sometimes in the deaths and in the estates and in the arrangements and all there, you, you get the you know, you can have a family crisis as to how all that's going to be done and, you know, different, doesn't have to be a lot of money, but there can be difference in agreement as to what the interpretation of the person who died, you know, what they wanted and uh, there's all kinds of things that are involved in just a, the loss of someone. Mm -hmm. I also know uh, for, through my father's experience that a lot of times when a person dies and you outlive them, you see the family maybe go estranged. My father's mother, uh, when she passed away, he didn't talk to his brothers or sisters, and there's eight of them for 40 years. For 40 years? He just this year got back in touch with them. So, I mean, and he was there when she passed away and saw just everything just disintegrate with the family. Go ahead. There's also uh, another phase that uh, they have a tendency, well, they're learning that they can't make long-range plans. Like I have a, a, uh, uh, my ex, -hus my ex-husband's mother, which we're very close, we're still very close, is 80. And uh, sometimes she'll say, um, well, I hope to see you next week. Yeah. You know, they make a shorter yeah. term. Right. You know, they're, you afraid just to make, know. they're afraid to make uh, uh, vacation plans a year away. Though it would be a better price break for them, they're afraid to do that because mm -hmm. they may not be there. And then uh, another thing that happens, the, the older you live, <coughs> your children may die. And I'm told that that's probably the most painful thing that a parent, unless you've got a really estranged family or whatever, you know. And, and sometimes we don't, we don't recognize that as much, uh, you know, if, if the parent is 80 and the child is 60, and we think, well, 60 was old enough to die or whatever, we don't recognize that for the 80-year-old, this is still their child, and, and it's a different perspective. So well, there's some real disadvantages to growing old. <laughs> I'm still opting for it, you know, but uh, some things to think about there. Yeah, Karen. I would think even if you live a really long time, it could be disturbing. And if you are one of these people who stay sharp and you're not, the nursing home does not remain your, doesn't become your world, just the big changes. I mean, you think of I think of my grandmother now, she passed away in her early 60s and didn't see maybe as much, but she was born in the 1880s and lived, lived through to the you know, 60s or 70s and you think of the vast changes that occurred over that time. I mean, because I think about the fact that when my father was born in the 20s, 
they were still actually using a covered wagon to get from Texas to Arizona. And that they, or the, but that was because they traded the Model A. I mean, they'd taken a Model A trip, you know, which took two weeks to get from Oregon back to Tennessee. And Michael tells stories about the peanut butter sandwiches they ate for the whole trip. But anyway, um, and, and that's mind-boggling to think of the difference in transportation and everything else and think how much the world would change, how disturbing that could be, you know, just, just as everything shifts on you. Okay, and things keep changing faster, don't they? You know, in 1969, when the astronauts walked on the moon, my grandmother never believed it. She went to her grave believing that it was a television hoax because she very flatly, I mean, a little country woman, elementary school education, and she said if God had wanted men on the moon, he had built a ladder up there. That was that. Cut and dried, period, stop. You know, and I mean, howdy doody, the Lone Ranger, those were the things, you know, whatever all stuff came on TV in the beginning. Uh, she knew that was fabricated. And so she just chose not to believe it. Robert. Well, my grandmother, I talk to my grandparents a lot, and as they get older, they, um, they watch a lot of the media. And I, I know the media harps a lot on the bad things in society. And so when they see that, and there, there is probably, there, I'm not going to say that there isn't a lot of bad things that have happened as t time has gone by, but it's like they're always t reminding me about, um, it's, they're always talking about the welfare program. Uh, <laughs> they're always talking about crime and violence. And they're always talking about, because uh, they're always watching the news and watching what's happening all over the world and stuff like that. So they have a real pessimistic kind of view of the world because watching the, the news can make you depressed yeah, yeah. They always remind me they say you know like well we had it bad in the depression but it was like a different kind of bad it was like it, was, it wasn't like all the violence and stuff they're mm -hmm. saying we, we were starving to death you, st but you it, didn't have to lock your doors yeah. you could leave your windows open at night you know it's, it was a different kind of thing but it instilled a different set of values in terms of waste not want not you know, clean your plate, hang on to everything because you might need it later for something. Mm -hmm. That brings up another point. A lot of them are having a hard time with the new uh, TV sets and the VCRs, and they're they're feeling like they're, they're not being, the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> but they feel like they're being left behind because of the computer age and, mm -hmm. the, and all the new technology. So they have a tendency to drift back a little bit. No, my VCR is so smart that you know. One daughter and I couldn't get it set, but fortunately my son-in-law, who's an engineer, came through and punched all the right buttons, so we taped the show. We, we just missed one button, that was all. <laughs> okay, well let's shift gears for a moment or so uh, and spend some time talking about how stress contributes to crisis. Okay, we've, we've alluded to some th of these things already. But as, as stress builds up, it may uh, precipitate an urgent situation. Less, in the first class, we talked about emergencies, crises, and what we call urgencies, situations that are going to need some attention before they turn into a stressful situation. Well, let's get a definition of stress. And recognize, first of all, that stress is normal. Stress is normal. It's a normal form of anxiety or emotional tension, often occurring in persons confronted with a situation, and here's the crucial part, in which the performance is important and the outcome is uncertain. And, and that's what makes it stressful for one person when it isn't for another. You know, uh, if you know how to feed the paper into the computer printer and it's annoying, but you know how to fix it, then that's a very low level kind of stress. But if the power drive goes out, for me, that's a big deal. You know, you can't find a file, well, maybe that's stressful, maybe it isn't. Uh, if you're accustomed to hiding things from yourself and your computer files and, you know, you know how to search for them. So it's important to recognize that stress is normal. 
that we all live with, and most of us live with crises all the time, uh, too, which is part of what brings us together in a class like this. But uh, if we can say, okay, you know, I, I live stress. I jump hoops. I jump hurdles. This is how I live. All right, this is normal. Uh, but the crucial part here is recognizing that the performance is important and the outcome is uncertain. So there's some things then that we can ask and observe about this. That stress, if it's controlled, produces creativity and energy. Some of you have to put those term papers off until the last week of the semester or 72 hours before they're due or whatever. Oh. In order to get your stress level up high enough that your creativity kicks in and your energy kicks in and, and you start uh, being more productive. Okay, some things you can ask and, and do in evaluation. Ask one, who is in control? How many choices are there? And we'll come back to this in a minute. What is the worst thing that can happen? And if it does happen, then what? You know, I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? You die? You end up in the hospital for six months? Well, that's a, I'd probably rather die. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, but what is the worst thing that's going to happen in this situation? And if it does happen, then what? You want to be aware of nonverbal communication effects. Don't promise what you can't deliver. That will help reduce your stress. Try to stay flexible in your commitments. You know, if, if uh, eight students come by the last week of the semester asking for letters of recommendation, I may need to say, I can't do all of these this week. I have term papers to grade. I have such and such going on. You're going to have to wait. You know, can I have two weeks? Can I have three weeks? What kind of flexibility? do we have here? Admit mistakes, but don't repeat them. Keep communication lines open. And accept stress as normal. But the control issue is an, an important one. We were talking about that earlier. You know, do you have power or are you powerless in this situation? And someone asked earlier tonight, you know, how many choices are there? How many choices do you have in the situation? And that's a question that we'll raise throughout the course as we're trying to assess the level of the crisis and how we're going to help the person get out of the crisis. How many choices do we have in this situation? Okay, what are some things that happen? We're going to look at results of stress, and then we will look at causes of stress. Okay, I've got one showing here already, anger. You, ever, you find your temper flaring, the more stressed you get, the shorter your fuse is. And, and one way to become aware that you're experiencing anger, I mean that you're experiencing stress, is to recognize that your fuse is getting short and you're getting angry. What else happens? Okay, uh, Karen and then Robert. Well, sometimes you just also start experiencing, um, I start becoming a little more forgetful or whatever. I start having trouble keeping track of all the things I've got to do. And in fact, I start feeling like, I've described it as feeling like uh, my disk is full and I'm getting disk full error messages uh -huh. up here. And I discover that my brain seems to act, it, it seems to uh, randomly pick one thing to forget. It's not necessarily <laughs> the last thing I've put in. It just sort of, and generally that's not it, but it will pick something else I should have remembered. 
and, and just kind of drop right out. And so I'll be driving down the road and suddenly remember two days, you know, suddenly going, oh, there was a I meeting. I missed a to... meeting yesterday. <laughs> or two days ago, yes. Or, or two days ago. Okay, Robert? I was going to say exhaustion or t uh, fatigue. Some okay. type of fatigue. Good. Mm -hmm. A sense of feeling overwhelmed and depressed. Okay, depression. Good, you're getting several of these. Let's go. Okay, tension, frustration, illness, which is related to fatigue, accidents. Let's just go ahead and uncover these and, and look at them here. Oh. So forgetfulness, we've got on the list, depression. Do you find yourself getting in more little accidents? Because you get distracted, bang into things, don't pay attention, cut yourself with a knife, hit your thumb with the hammer. <laughs> Do you have a sore finger tonight? <laughs> We have one student here with a sore finger because she got stressed today. Okay. Uh, yeah, we may just get more accident prone, but the forgetfulness is certainly one. It's, it's an information overload. You know, your brain receives lots of information. You've got channels, just like the computer has channel capacity, your brain has channel capacity, but we've all got limits. And as you get more tired, then it's harder to assimilate all, and it, it starts compounding itself, doesn't it? Okay, so uh, you know, we may have insomnia. Uh, some people turn to alcohol or other drugs, and it may start with something simple like your little pop a pill at night or whatever, we won't advertise brands here, but you know, uh, whatever it is you take just to help you sleep a little bit better, and may end up with prescription drugs or whatever. And, and these are just some of the kinds of things that result from stress. Okay, let's look then at the things that cause the stress. And, and you get, the first one I have up here is trauma. The stress contributes to crises, but at the same time crises and traumas contribute to stress. So you get a kind of chicken egg dilemma going. And unless you can intervene in there somewhere and put some kind of stop to it, get the brakes on it, then it may keep feeding on itself. Why would I put power on here? You might have more responsibilities if you have more power. The more power you have, the more responsibility you have, and that's not always an easy thing, and especially if you take that power seriously. Now, if you're a mean old dictator type, you know, that's a different thing. But if you're a person who uh, is trying to wield that power wisely and conscientiously and caringly, you know, if you're a good manager, if you're a good CEO, uh, and then you have layoff, you're forced for financial reasons, to have layoffs within your company, so for, you know those may be very difficult things that cause existential crises for people, uh, that cause situational crises. <clears throat> and while managers may not lose their jobs, uh, there are a lot of managers that have heart attacks and other uh, physical problems because they're the ones that have to break the bad news to the people under them. So. Power is not always a good thing. Uh, any other observation on that? I'm thinking of rock stars and people that get fame and then have problems. And, and sometimes not only is the, there's a responsibility with the power, but there's prices like either loss of, loss of privacy or, or also just that the buck stops there. So you take the blame a lot too. If, you, if you're the person with the power, then you know, then if something goes wrong, whether or not you caused it, you're taking the heat for it. Okay, and on that previous visual, we had the note that says, admit your mistakes, but don't repeat them. You know, if, if the buck stops on your desk and there's a mistake, then it's yours. You get to claim it. And, and most situations allow you a few mistakes. 
you know, you, depending on what it is. But, but you can mess up now and then a little bit about some things. But if you keep making the same mistakes over, then you're going to have to deal with that. Okay, power comes from information overload, may come from that. It may be a result of span of control. You just have more pots boiling than you can stir at one time, more employees that you are students or projects or whatever uh, than you are capable and able physically to take care of. But worse than power is powerlessness. And we were talking about this with people, sometimes uh, people who are in nursing homes and so forth. That as, as you age and as you lose control, you lose power. Who else lacks power besides people in, potentially people in nursing homes? Okay, Karen? Well, categories, <coughs> children. <laughs> or unfortunately, if you're poor, you will you lack a lot of power because okay. unfortunately, money buys a lot. Okay. Now, how do children get power? How do they try to get power? Maybe I should refine oh, tantrums. Some. Oh, tantrums! <laughs> yes, I've got some successful moms in this audience <laughs> whose children don't win very often. Unfortunately, uh, gangs may be a way of the people are trying to develop some power. I don't have it individually, but as a group we might, you know, mm -hmm. and certainly as a group we scare a lot more people, we feel powerful. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to game playing later on, but temper tantrums and games that children play are attempts to get power. But powerlessness is generally worse than power. Homeless people, now there, you, hit, you see a story every now and then of a homeless a uh, person who's doing rather well, who's touring America. Uh, Ginger, you want to do a quick synopsis of that little story? Terminal, but she's chosen to walk across America. She's walked 2,000 miles, and it's a spiritual self-healing journey. And is she's 55, and it's just having a lovely time. And she just—it's her attitude. Mm -hmm. But she chooses to be, I mean, so, so not a all of crises, homeless right. people that are low on power are in crisis. She, and she's not standing by a freeway with a sign saying, you know, feed me. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. There's another form of powerlessness is uh, people that are in a catastrophic situation like a flood, watching mm -hmm. their home floating down. Right. Or you watch it burn right after it survives the flood. Yeah. Okay, when you are powerless, you often feel like you're a pawn. You know, people are just pushing and shoving you around. And when, when we're in a community crisis, a hurricane, a tornado, a flood, an earthquake, any kind of major crisis like that, you're just kind of like a pawn. You're being moved and shoved and evacuated and rescued and placed here and placed there, and, and you just wait for the rescue boat or vehicle or whatever to move you to the next location. And there are people who feel that way emotionally, that they get so overloaded and so stressed that emotionally they're pawns. They've lost the ability to make good, clear choices, to control their own lives, and so they're just kind of push and shove, pushed and shoved maybe from one class to the next, from class to work, from work to home, to you know, the laundry, to the homework, to the class, to the <laughs> They're smiling out here. <laughs> they know the feeling <laughs> and all. And, and <clears throat> most of us catch this from time to time. But usually we have coping skills or we have people who help us or one way or another we're able to get a grip and pull out of it. Mm -hmm. Karen? And there's another version of that I was thinking of because um, my mother, who, who's been deceased quite a few years, so I'm safe talking about this, mm -hmm. um, admitted that she was told when she was in college that really she had was overly dependent on her father. And they really pushed her to try and go get a job and, and away from home, like not go home that summer 
but but go out and be independent. And she tried. She said she was a miserable summer and everything else. And and she even admitted later that really probably when she got when she married my father, that really she just transferred that. She was still um, allowing herself to be powerless in a sense, choosing that because she didn't feel capable of of doing, you know, taking control of it or whatever, emotionally, you know, just letting someone else be in control. Mm -hmm. Yes. That also brings up the battered wife syndrome, where they feel like they're trapped in a situation and uh, they have no power over it. Right. Now, we'll look at that in, in more depth later on, but that's a situation where it's better to stay and be battered than to try to get out and cope with all the adverse consequences to go with a different choice. Fear. What do we get afraid of? What do we fear? Okay. The unknown. The unknown, yes. Okay, there it is, number two. We fear failure and we fear the unknown. And there are all kinds of specific uh, ramifications and permutations of that. But most of the things that we're afraid of fall into those two categories. Because this society especially has primed us and taught us that we're supposed to succeed, we're supposed to do well. You know, you can make some arrows in math for a while, but then you're supposed to learn your arithmetic. You're supposed to learn how to spell words. You're supposed to learn your job. <clears throat> whatever it is you're doing, you're supposed to learn how to do it and then do it well. And when we get in new and strange circumstances where the outcome is important but uncertain, we get afraid. Nancy. Hopefully if you're accomplishing anything in your life, you're going to have a feeling of raw panic. <laughs> along the way and you know I've, when I sense that's coming on part of I guess the maturation just shows me that that's a good sign that at least you're trying something different or you, you know, think kinda, panic is healthy <laughs> well or just that it's a normal part of life and it's not disabling or it shouldn't stop you it's just something that most people if they're honest will feel occasionally you know when, especially when you're trying something new or that stretches you behind or, you know, something that you're not accustomed to doing. Mm -hmm. And we're really dealing with a continuum, aren't we? From light stress down here to heavy stress to sheer, total, unadulterated panic at <laughs> the other end, crisis. Next week, we'll be talking about panic attacks uh, more specifically. But, yeah, and, the, and, and what causes panic for one person doesn't for another because the meaning is in the mind of the receiver. But we won't drift too far into that. But fear of failure, fear of the unknown. You know, and how much stuff we worry about, and I'm guilty too, <laughs> friends out there watching know, uh, of worrying about stuff that never happens. Now I can rationalize, you see, and say, well, if I didn't worry about it, then it probably would happen because I wouldn't take the appropriate, the appropriate uh, preventive measures. And sometimes that's true. And a lot of what we'll be talking about and have been already with crises is recognizing what you can do on the front end to avert that crisis in the first place. You know, but anyway, competition. Karen, you want to add something? Well, your last comment reminded me of something. I read a book several years ago that talked about, and it was called The Luck Factor, and it talked about, you know, they'd done some studies on what made people unlucky or what made people very lucky, and they said unlucky people were people who were overly optimistic and so expected that terrible things would never happen to them and made no preparations or, if anything, actually, you know, kind of waltzed along the edge a lot of times kind of, you know, putting themselves in a position to let more things happen. They set themselves up, in a sense, for, for a lot of... And then later when those things happen, it's like, gosh, I can't imagine how unlucky I am, you know. Yeah, how could that have happened to me? That's interesting. I never thought about that. Okay? I just have to tell this story. It's very short. My father used to travel a lot on 
uh, the planes back when Hobby Airport was the main the airport, airport in Houston. And they used to have the little machines there where you could take last minute flight insurance and he would always get extra flight insurance to make sure the plane wouldn't go down. <laughs> <laughs> he knew that would keep it in the air. <clears throat> okay. Competition. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Carol? Ellen, and I think really and truly, it, I don't think there's very many people who hate it in all circumstances. I suspect it's really directly related, how much you dislike it or not, would be related to, in the specific instance, how likely you think you can actually succeed. Again, the old fear of failure. Mm -hmm. where, where you really dislike competition is where it looks like the odds aren't good for you. Oh, it looks like you're going to lose, and the outcome is important. Yeah. Because there's some things you can lose. Now, some people I know can't lose at anything or don't like losing at anything, I should say. Oh. But then, you know, parents learn that whether it's Monopoly or Scrabble or Old Maid or whatever, it's no big deal and it's okay to lose. Some people I know can't even lose those things. Oh. But they'll go unnamed and all. Uh, but, then, but then there are other things. Are you ready to say something here? I just was thinking of the, you know, the typical Little League stories when uh, not, not only are the boys uh, competitive, but the parents are in the mm -hmm. stands and all the things that I'm sure we have plenty of stories or remember them of things that happen in that context, you know, with the parents and the children. And, and often it's the parents that are far more competitive than the children. Well, and I think of the school Alex went to in Wichita where they were so careful to have absolutely zero competition. There were no grades. When they had track and field day, they did all these silly little things, and all you had to do was participate in everything. There were no winners. Nobody lost. Nobody won. Everybody participated in every activity, and it took about 50 parents to do it so that, so that there would be all these silly little things for the kids to do. But there was no, I mean, I could have never been to a track and field day that had zero competition. Hold the ball between your knees and jump around. This is the this is the event. I mean, it was just they were silly things, but they were so serious about having zero competition among the kids in the school. They were kind of had a hippie mentality and <laughs> probably should have lived out in the country with the butterflies and the bees. But <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. I had a friend that once related that competition was like an adrenaline rush and it was like a mental roller coaster. And there are really uh, adrenaline junkies out there, mm -hmm. I think. No, there are. I had a speech major who, who worked for a major company as a sales rep. And she would call me, I mean, that was 10 years ago or so and she was making 60000 a year and she'd call and say, put a such and such rep out of business today, you know. And I would feel badly. I mean, you know, I would want more sales, you know, and I'd want a bigger commission. But if I knew that, that expanding my territory put Robert out of work, I'd feel bad about that, you know. So I obviously didn't belong in that kind of a job working for that kind of company. But for some people, there is that kind of rush. You know, there are some situations where everybody wins, Everyone who participates gets a certificate or a little trophy and nobody gets the big uh, trophy. There are other situations where it's a team activity like the football team, the baseball team, the uh, whatever group, the forensics team. You know, and, and when the team wins, then they all theoretically win. Even though there's usually, we're going to look at uh, system theory a little later on this evening. Uh, we'll see that that there's a hierarchy within groups too, and the power starts to filter its way back down and everything. So competition uh, has different effects on people. Conflict is often stressful. Some people handle conflict better than others. You know, and and can just say. Well, this is that kind of situation. You know, if you're in customer complaints, customers, anybody ever work in customer complaints? Yeah, a couple of people. You know, uh, of course, one thing, it's, it's not really you they're after. 
you know, you have to deal with it, but it's your problem, but it's not your problem at 5 o'clock when you punch out. Can you go home and leave it and all? Oh. But most of us don't like to be in conflict situations. We work really hard to get along with people, to be cooperative, to work for consensus, to do things that are, are peaceful, uh, ameliorating kinds of activities. Karen? In fact, I've, I have come to recognize that that's probably the fastest way to push my button and get me angry is in if I'm with a group of people who are all being trying to conciliate and we've got the one hard head who's try making it hard for everybody else, that's when I start wanting to just, you know, take them outside. Squaring and, you off. Know. <laughs> you will cooperate. <laughs> We're telling you you're going to cooperate. And you're going to like it. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I can see January as the conflict month of the year because everybody doesn't want to or wants to bring returns back from Christmas presents. Oh. <laughs> and having to justify why you're returning some things and seeing the salespeople. And then try to figure out how to tell your relatives why you returned it. <laughs> you bought the wrong size again. I hate that color. <laughs> okay. Uh, I listed three general areas there <clears throat> that are sources of conflict. Mistakes. Most of us get really annoyed when people make mistakes. Care? We also get really annoyed if other people point out our mistakes. Oh, yes. And if there are mistakes, it's even worse, isn't it? Particularly if we're told about it. Especially if we're already maybe feeling just a tad worried about it. We don't want people noticing it or pointing it out or, you know, Especially if you also feel like it may you know, put you at some risk now. Because yeah, we have this principle of perfection that we try to live up to. And even though in our hearts we know we never make it, we keep striving for it. And we like we to preserve guilty. the illusion. Mm -hmm. And then we feel guilty when we don't make it and it gets all very complicated. Okay, disagreements. You know, um, we disagree with spouses, with children, with friends, with co-workers. And gets lumpy. The, the disagreement are interesting because that's a normal part of life. But so mm -hmm. many times what you, you see as a normal disagreement, dis, disagreement you, you may deal with a dysfunctional family or a situation where they don't behave in a normal way which makes even more of a conflict. Mm -hmm. It takes a life of its own. Right. And then finally annoyances and we've all got pet peeves. I don't like crunchy ice. I don't like sniffly noses. You know we've all got our list of the things that annoy us. So okay these are some of the causes of stress. We have looked at results of stress. Uh, we're going to pause here and uh, then when we come back, we're going to look at some other theoretical perspectives that help us understand uh, why crises occur, and hopefully we can work toward prevention when we understand those perspectives. <laughs>